Hope is learning about the Holocaust right now. They just read this really um, profound book by a survivor of the Holocaust. And so um, it's really affecting her. And I don't know if y'all remember the first time you learned about the Holocaust when you were young. And that just really freaked me out because I never knew that there would, could be such evil in the world. And I just remember thinking, I almost wish I didn't know that because it's so hard to grapple with that kind of mm. darkness. And the whole concept that that kind of darkness has happened here made me feel so unsafe because in the back of my mind, I used to believe that, well, everyone's really good. Like, it, they're, you know, if they are evil, it's because something happened to them. But when I learned about that, and then, and, then, and then also some of the things like that that happened in Rwanda, and just some of the things we see, like, it's the opposite. Like, men are not good, and what we need is a surgery for our hearts. And so, but, but Hope was asking me, like, Mom, why would God let that happen? And um, so I, I have to say, I don't know. I said, that's one of the things I'll ask when we get to heaven, or like, how do some of these atrocities happen? And you, you let it. But I'm not sure, but I do know that he is Emmanuel, that he is with us. And whenever we go through the dark things, that he is, he's, he's available to us to walk beside us and to comfort us as we go through them, even in the Holocaust. And we know that because Corey Ten Boom was, the, was there too in that time. This is what I sent her last night as I was just thinking about her question. And these are some of the quotes from Corey Ten Boom. She, one of her principles is that prayer is the key for the day, the lock for the and the lock for the night. Despite illness, abuse, and grief, Corey and her sister Betsy did their best to give thanks to God. Upon installment in the overcrowded Robinsbrook bar barracks, Betsy reminded Corey, Betsy was her sister who passed away there, um, that they were to give thanks in every circumstance. However, when Betsy gave thanks for the fleas, because they would sleep, the barracks were covered in fleas, even Corey balked, yet she gave thanks, and in the months following, discovered that the same fleas that tormented them nightly kept the guards from intruding upon the safety of the barracks during the day. So, her sister would give thanks for these fleas because the fleas were there, the guards wouldn't come in, and therefore they could share the gospel with those in the barracks. And so, um, and that was touched my heart. And so, um, a less, this is also a, a lesson that she learned from her father. Um, and and uh, there was one point in, in, in Corey Ten Boom's life where she was in love with this young man, but he married another woman, and it just broke her heart. And her father told her something that she carried with her um, to help her get through the very dark times of going through the Holocaust. And he told he this is this was the opportunity he said this to her. This was when her heart was broken from the young man, but before she knew all the other things that were going to happen. But he said, "Corey, do you know what hurts so very much? It's love. Love is the strongest force in the world, and when it's blocked." That means pain. There are two things we can do when this happens. We can kill the love so that it stops hurting, but then of course, part of us dies too. Or Corey, we can ask God to open up another route for that love to travel. Whenever we can not love in an old human way, God can give us a perfect way. And I love that. And that's what she carried that with her and it helped her get through the um, hard times of going through the Holocaust. She said about this quote that her father, he put this in my hands, the secret that would open far darker rooms than this place, places where there was not on a human level anything to love at all. In darkness, God's light shines most clear. And when I think about the time we're in now, I think about that and how, man, it's getting dark. But God's light is here. And boy, it gets clear to see and easy to see. And this is not in my lesson, but I was just thinking about the, this this morning on the drive over here. Whenever 
Zachariah first heard the good news that they were going to have the child that was going to be the the light of he was going to be the way maker for the light of the world there was a um, he he broke out in prophecy and um, and this was uh, after his son was born uh, after John was born and one of the things he says in this prophecy is um, and it's in Luke 1 um, 78 it says through the tender mercy of God with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace and I think about that word the day spring because in Hebrew times when Hebrew still they look their day starts in the evening and it ends when the sun rises because for them, the world starts in darkness and light always overcomes it. But when you think about the world that doesn't know God and the world that's disconnected from God, this is their light. This is all they're going to get because there's not going to be a day spring for them springing forth because they, they don't want it. They prefer dark, like Jesus said, men prefer darkness over the light. So this is all the light they're going to see, and that light is in us, the light of Christ in us. And uh, so our day spring from on high has visited us. He is our day, and we're walking through what to us looks like night right now. But our day is coming because this is the dark, and the light's overcoming the dark. But for those who do not know, the little they think this darkness is light because we're carrying the light of the world in us. And he is here, but he won't always be here. So, another, a greater question, when getting back to the Cory Ten Boom and my daughter's question of why God would allow this to happen, um, the greater question we might ask instead of how God would allow this to happen is, is God with me in the midst of this happening? And we can say yes. And that's what Emmanuel is all about. We know that the first mention of Emmanuel was given to this as a sign to an apostate king. And we're going to talk about the second mention of Emmanuel today and the third mention today. But the second mention, God is demonstrating his oneness with us that even while Israel was about to go into captivity, that he, that he was going to be with them. And the third mention is, of course, when God fulfills his prophecy and demonstrates his oneness with us, uh, whether we know it or not. His witness is like a fire. It demands a response. You can't ignore it because it's too powerful. Um, you can acknowledge him and be warmed and walk by the light of that fire and, go, and even get receive uh, and glorify him uh, in the midst of the glory. Are you you're going to be burned because once he comes. He's active, and um, he will be acknowledged one way or another. My goodness, Lord, whatever is happening, we just pray for these people. We pray, Lord, that you be with them, go before them, Lord, and stand beside them. And thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, Isaiah 8, 8 through 10 says, He will pass through Judah. He will overflow. He will pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land. O oh, Emmanuel, these are the words of God. And God is talking right here about an army that's going to overflow on his people. And he, he says, O oh, Emmanuel, be shattered. O oh, you people, be broken to pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken to pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken to pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. And it seems like when you read those words that if God is with you, then why is all this bad stuff happening? How are the enemies overflowing? How are these people going to be shattered? And, and even when they make plans, those plans will be shattered. It's, um, so that's what, that's what we're going to talk about, because sometimes God with us, it can look one way or it can look another way. And it's convicting because um, the way, whenever whenever I read this, at first I was like, well, if you're with them, that sure doesn't look like it. But, 
But when you look a little deeper, you see, oh my goodness, this is me. Oh, you people, be broken to pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, which is prepare yourselves, but be broken to pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken to pieces. He says it twice. Girding is, you know, getting yourself ready to face an enemy. He's, and we do that. And he's saying, take counsel together. Go and plan together how you're going to deal with this. But it come, but, but it'll come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. So we can see, when we look at what they were doing with this army that was coming against them, because their king would not believe God, and he would give lip service but not truly believe him, then we see a greater thing that's happening there. And it's, we can relate because this is sometimes how we respond when we see dark times coming. We start to gird ourselves, we start to make plans, and we try to say, speak words, but they come to nothing. Um, and that God is yet saying that I am here. I am with you. And, uh, and he even calls them Emmanuel, which means the width of God. If you can imagine God standing in a room with you and yet you're completely ignoring him and yet you see an enemy at the door and you're figuring out with your group of people how you're going to respond to the enemy but God's still he's sitting right there and instead of turning to him you're turning to the people and the flesh and saying we're going to deal with this and I and when I look at it like that I'm like that's very disrespectful to God <laughs> But we do it all the time. We do it all the time. I do it all the time. So you can plan all you want, but it won't work because the flesh doesn't work. This world doesn't work. But I am surely with you. Um, so I have asked myself this morning, if God is with us, then how can this happen? And, I, and that made me wonder, like, if God is with us, how can these things happen where we can look to ourselves but not to Him? And it made me think, okay, if faith moves things, then how, is there an opposite to faith? And I was asking God that and praying about that. I'm like, what is the opposite of faith? And, um, and I read some commentaries, and some say said that it's doubt, some that said it's apathy, and some said it's fear. And, and all those things could be fruit of the opposite of faith, but I still wasn't 100% sure. But when I, when I kind of got a feeling that what it might be, when I look at this scripture and I look at the other scriptures of Emmanuel, I conclude, I concluded, and this is me and my conclusion, but I think we can find evidence of it here, that the opposite of faith is actually faith. That it's faith in God or faith in us. So we can have faith in ourselves, which the whole world's telling us to do, by the way, or we can have faith in God. The problem is if we have faith in us, there's no substance to back it up. It's like standing on a piece of paper and thinking that that paper is going to save you. But when we stand in God, we can be saved because there's substance to who he is. And there's no substance to us. We, When we look to ourselves for faith, we, we can believe ourselves, we can believe each other. But I know for me, whenever, if I'm asking you for prayer, if I'm asking, if I'm, faith is manifested in God through you, and that's what I can have hope in. And even in myself, there's times when you guys may ask me for prayer, and I feel so inadequate and, and unable, and I am. It's because that's what's true. But when I can bring your request to God, He is adequate, and He is able, and He is real. And that's what I'm looking for in people. And so if I'm, if I'm looking to you and saying, pray for me because I have this problem, what I'm really saying is stand, stand next to me and with God and let's believe him because he's the only one that can do anything about this. Because we're moving to a time where we can't do anything about this. But he can and he has. 
So there's no substance in and of ourselves when, and I think sometimes we, it's important to think about this because we're in a time where we can easily get angry at people because they're not moving. When the whole point is they have nothing to move in and from. Only God does. And we can even get frustrated with ourselves because we're so powerless and weak and we can't help change anything. I have felt like that lately in um, my life circumstances, but yet God is able. And when I can come to him and believe him and have faith in his substance, I can trust that he is moving in ways that I can't see or imagine, and I may never fully understand until I stand before him face to face in heaven. But there's a substance to him that we don't, we can't hold up to in and of ourselves. Even if we huddle up and do our best, we can we can't we can do some things but we can't we can't change we can't really change much of the things that are really really we're confronting right now but god shows up he shows up and i think about some of the things that we've been through this year and there's a part of me that does want to run like huddle up in my house and just stay there and not want to come out, not want to confront, not want to face things, not even want to face people sometimes. Sometimes we think if we can just stay in this one little circle right here, then we can be safe. But how many of us get to? Because you know what God does? He, he is like a bully sometimes. He comes and picks you on you and will and picks at your circumstances till that very spot where you think you were safe, you're forced to come out of. And you're like, oh, so no matter what, if you think you're going to go somewhere where you can avoid him confronting you, you're wrong because he will go right into that very place and confront you. And then you'll have to come out and say, oh, yeah, I'm forced with this one choice. And that one choice is, am I going to trust you or am I going to trust me? And that's what we're getting at right here. He's saying, yeah, I, you, I know it's dark, but I am the light. I am the light. And we find that even in the, it takes that tiniest moment where we're saying, okay, you're the light. Ah, I believe you, but I'm not going to step a big step. I'm just going to step a little tiny step into you. And what happens? All of a sudden, we feel his peace. And we know... Oh my gosh, he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And I believe that's why Jesus said it doesn't take, he said it takes a, the, the, if you have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Because the minute that you step out of this little circle of your own safe place and to make the tedious step into who he is, the wholeness of who he is comes to get you. And even though maybe nothing out here changed, all of who you are in here changed. And that is a miracle to me. And it happens for each of us that trust him. Sometimes, millions of times a day. That tiny bit of faith that is so strong because we're placing it in the one who is over this whole world and overcame this whole world. Matthew 1, 21 through 23 says, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And this is the third mention of the name Emmanuel, which is, of course, Jesus literally coming in the flesh for us. You shall call his name Jesus. It's very personal what he spoke here. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. It just hit me that that's the, the, the truth of those words. Because God, Jesus, by the way, means salvation. So God, Jesus is our salvation. God is our salvation. And there's an order to it. Because he must become our salvation personally. You will call his name Jesus. And he will save his people from their sins. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. And when you think about that, that is 
amazing because the natural response would be, I will call his name Jesus. I will call his name salvation. And when I call his name salvation, when I call his name salvation and I step into the, full, the fullness of who he is, they get to see Emmanuel. And even people that don't know him will see God with us because we are bearing the light of the world. And it's not that we are the light of the world, it's that we get to be conduits of the light of the world. We get to be jars of clay that carry the light of the world. And they, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And sometimes I think we, take, we underestimate the power of, of that, the power of who we get to be and what we get to carry while we're here. If you think about Mary, she was carrying Jesus in her womb. That's pretty powerful. God of the world in her womb. But we carry the Holy Spirit in us, and that is powerful. Very powerful. <clears throat> um, we can't dissect who Jesus is from each of us personally from the way they see him. Um, because sometimes we get angry if people aren't seeing Jesus. Right? Why won't they see? And the, and the minute we do that, we're back here. So we could turn the finger back on us because the truth is, even if you don't see the response you want to see, that you think when they do this, I'll know they saw. That he's saying, just stay in me. I am with you, God with us. I am with you. I'm literally with you. And regardless of whether you believe it or not, they are seen. They're seeing God with us, Emmanuel. They shall call his name. They shall call his name, Emmanuel, the with of God. Maybe they're not to that place where they can make this step yet, but your job isn't to worry about that. It's just to sit here and just say, he is with me. And, and believe that and wait and wait upon him and trust him because it may take then seeing that over and over and over again. And maybe on the 342nd millionth time they see it, they're going to be like, I think God's with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't know, but he is moving. We may not see it, but he's saying, have faith. I am here and I'm alive in you. He is always with us. He is always saying to us, just as he did to Ahaz, um, I am with you. They can see me manifested or they can see you manifested. But only when they see me manifested will anything change. Because the truth is, before we see a mountain move, there's so many little pebbles that have to be, little rocks that have to be rolled out of the way. We, we don't know exactly that moment that takes when the whole mountain gets moved in someone's heart. But that is, only God can do that and not us. And sometimes, for me, um, some of the things that hurt most are the moments where I see that I'm back here. Because God is constantly moving like a limb. It's constantly, as you're growing in here, your branches are stretching out here. And there's points where I arrive somewhere I don't know how to be. And, and, and so automatically when that happens, I go right back here because this is my safe place. And this whole thing of stepping out in faith is happening over and over and over again. He's, and and but my, my propensity is to say, I'm afraid, I'm scared. And I don't know if I trust you right now. And he says, there's one place I can always look and know that I can trust him. And he reminds me of the blood. The blood that was spilled for me. And then I can know the, the blood of Jesus will say, yes, when I look back at the cross and how much you love me there, I can trust that I can step out and know that you love me here. And I may be weird, but I never get over that. That just still could make me cry right now. I'm going to try not to. But um, 1 John 5, 7 and 8 says, 
For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. And you know what he's saying those, are, those things are testifying about? That us, that we're saved, that we're redeemed. The blood testifies that we are fully redeemed, fully justified before God. And regardless of your doubts that say, eh, does he really love me? Am I really saved? Am I really going to heaven? He can say, talk to the blood. Like, yes, I love you. You're safe and you're coming to spend eternity with me. We can look at the water and say, I'm clean. I don't feel clean, but I know I am because your, your water literally came out of your body to clean me. And we can look at the spirit and say, you are with me with me and I feel alone but you are here regardless of how I feel you're right here with me and we can feel the comfort of his love even if we can't see him face to face in verse 10 of that first John 5 it says whoever believes in the son has this testimony in himself and whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony of God has borne concerning his son the whole reason God sent his son is to love us. And so we can know this one truth that the whole time we're here, Jesus is loving you. That he is loving you with everything that he has. Sometimes he says to me this, Rhonda, one of us is, a, is lying right now. And it's either me or you, and I don't lie. I don't know if he talks to you like that, but he can be pretty strict with me sometimes. Do you believe my son that I sent for you, or do you believe you? Because I am with you, but you feel separate from me right now. And I don't know if anyone can relate, but I was, because I was abandoned, I felt, struggled with abandonment issues growing up. I still struggle with that sometimes. And when I get scared, there, when you're abandoned and you're, neglected so you know um you feel like kind of maybe you know you have to deal with things alone a lot as a growing up that you can often be very self-protective and you learn i don't need anybody anyway i can just do it myself and i still do that i still do that sometimes and even if i don't do it out here in my mind i think it and and god is always kept He's like, don't you know you're a wonder in this world? You're a heavenly oxymoron. You're made of dust, yet you're the very price of heaven paid for you. And even there's Amy Carmichael has this quote, which I've never forgotten. If I ever consider myself as more than dust at the foot of the cross, I know nothing of Calvary love. And when I think about that, I'm like, yes, I can't. What we're doing when we're saying, I can do this myself, is I can do this apart from God. But we can't because we're just dust. But yet, we're dust mingled with the very blood of God. And that makes us decorated dust, eternal dust. Dust that's, that he loved enough to come and put together and make eternal beings out of. And, uh, and this goes all the way back, this faith in Jesus that he's calling us to have, this knowledge that he is with us, goes all the way back to Gen Gen starting in Genesis 3 when we were first disconnected from him. And there's so many scriptures. If you read the Bible and light, looking for Jesus, you're going to find him, that scarlet thread knit all the way throughout the word of God. But in Genesis 3, the, from the very beginning, we see the first moment of faith in Jesus, this faith that he is with us and that he's going to reconcile us to him. And the moment happens when right after they fell into sin and right after all the curses are pronounced over them by God, pronounced over Adam and, and at that time woman, she didn't have a name yet, um, when Adam looks at Eve and says, your name is Eve because you are the mother of all living. And for that, it took faith to, for him to call her that after what he just heard. Um, her name, Eve, points to redemption, the mother of all living. So when, when God is saying all these curses, even in the midst of the curses, by faith, Adam heard a promise. And that, to me, I don't know what that does to you, but that gives me such hope right now. Because there, right now, we can look around and say, all I see is curses, all I see is darkness. But there, in the midst of the curse, there's a promise. 
In the midst of all the darkness, there's the promise of Jesus. And that's the one thing that he's telling us to focus on. Because this is what... Um, this is what they had just heard. This isn't the whole thing, because first he cursed the serpent. Then he said, then God said to woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Doesn't sound like good news. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, um, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. <clears throat> Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And when you hear that and you think about what's going on and that we live in that, sometimes we still agree with this. But what Adam saw was there was a promise because that woman's going to bear a child. And in the midst of when God cursed the serpent, he said, and you shall bruise his head, that he shall bruise your heel. And so he was, he was finding from the very beginning a promise of the, the same Messiah, the same Emmanuel that is with us right now. So there could be a life of striving where we get nowhere, or there could be a life of hoping in the promise of Christ. Who, the one who is creating substance out of, who is our substance to, um, out of uh, nothingness. And when you think, I say out of nothingness because when, if you don't have faith in Christ, you're, when we stand on our own two feet and we try and take courage from each other, we're literally taking courage, we're trying to find substance from something that has no substance. Like, if I say, I'm going to make a meal to you out of this air, you're like, what? That doesn't, that's not going to happen because there's nothing to make it out of. But if you give me some, a loaf of bread, some peanut butter and jelly, now I have something. Like, we don't have anything to make anything with. And I don't think we realize that all the time. But in God, the one who made everything has given himself to us. He said, trust in my promises, and you can stand in me. And there is substance to what he says because he is, he is the fulfillment of all substances. And so, um, in fact, and the, just to point this a little more, um, in Genesis um, 3, 14, God speaking to the serpent says, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So without... Jesus, I mean, this is just my lingo. I think without Jesus, we're doomed to a life of being snake food. And 